Boss makes me do slave labor, doesn't pay, gives me a $50 gift card. So I make him pay. Here's what happened. Subscribe to Am I the Jerk on YouTube and hit the bell for notifications. I grew up in a small town in the south. Summer jobs were hard to come by, unless you wanted to drive an hour away to the city. We had a few mechanics, some gas stations, a general store, and a church on every block. There were a lot of farms around that would hire high school kids, but summers in the south are hot and humid. The holy grail was an indoor job with air conditioning. The summer before my senior year, I thought that my buddies and I, let's call them Fred and Ben, had landed an awesome job at the general store. The owner, who I'll call D-Face, needed three people to unload the trucks and stock shelves in the morning. We had to report for work at 5 a.m., but it was only three days a week and we were done by 10, meaning we had the rest of the day to lay around and fish. Now, there were some red flags that I, being young, did not recognize at the time. The fact that D-Face wrote IOU slips at the end of every week instead of checks was a huge one. He promised to pay us in full at the end of the month. We were kind of peeved that we wouldn't have the money to spend, but it was an easy job with good hours, so we kept working, looking forward to that sweet paycheck at the end of the month. With it being an under the table job, there there wasn't too much I could do. The time comes. D-Face tells us at the end of our shift that our paychecks are clipped to our time cards. Ecstatic to finally be paid, we go in, open the envelopes, and see that we've each been given a $50 gift certificate to the store. The strange and growing mixture of confusion and horror is a set of feelings that I will always remember. Fred, Ben, and I approach D-Face behind the cash register and tentatively ask when we are really going to get paid. He looked at us like we were the dumbest people he'd ever seen. That is your pay, he said. We called BS and demanded real checks. Well, I can't do that. All I can give you is the gift certificate. What happened next was what you'd expect from a couple of peeved off high school rednecks. Obscenities were shouted, some things were thrown, Fred kicked over a candy display, and we stormed out of there swearing, and I was just seeing absolute red. That guy had used us for slave labor, took advantage of some high school kids to get free work for a month. It went without saying that we were thirsty for vengeance. Now, this was a long time ago, like pre-internet, pre-desert storm long time ago, and we lived in a very rural area, so we couldn't just call some bureau of labor or go viral on social media or whatever people think of as revenge these days. Heck, we couldn't even really tell our parents, because they would have said it was a learning experience or some such thing. There was really no concept of workers' rights or anything like that. Heck, in this particular state, there still isn't to this day. We had to handle this ourselves. From then on, we had nightly meetings on a piece of property owned by Fred's dad. There was only one purpose, one subject of discussion, revenge. We went through all the usual options, arson, vandalism, and so on. But in the end, we decided that straight out theft would be the most reasonable option. We were gypped for a month's work, and for the scales of justice to balance, we needed payment. As I said, this was a long time ago. D-Face had some cameras, but they were poor quality and there were only a few. One out front, one by the register, and one over the beer coolers. There were no cameras in the loading dock or the back room, where the beer overstock was stored. We knew this because we had seen the little monitor display in D-Face's office. There was also an old doorway that was boarded over and sealed with polyurethane in the back of the building, but was otherwise unsecured. In other words, our work was cut out for us. We parked in the woods behind the store and watched it for a few nights to see if D-Face had taken any additional security precautions in light of his deception. He hadn't. The closing cashier just locked the front door at 9pm and left. We met up the next night at about 2am. The town was dead asleep. We piled into Fred's oversized pickup truck, drove to the store, killed the headlights, and pulled up to the loading dock. My heart had been thudding in my chest the whole drive over, but now a sort of steel calm had come over me. I was hyper alert, yet calm as the eye of a storm. Our time had come. The wooden door went down with ease when Ben put his shoulder to it. We slipped into the back room, stationed ourselves in sort of an assembly line by the beer racks, and unloaded the place. Cases of beer and jugs of wine practically flew out of the back into Fred's truck with ruthless efficiency. In the space of maybe less than 20 minutes, we had the back room cleaned out. 
We cleaned out that jerk so fast, I don't think he would have had time to poop his pants if he somehow caught us. We would have been done and gone. We pulled the defunct door back into place, threw a tarp over our loot, and drove to the same property where we had held our vengeance meetings. There was a disused tool shed towards the back, behind some pretty thick bush, and that's where we had decided to put everything. Unloading and carrying all the stuff took considerably longer than snatching it, even with a wheelbarrow, and the sky was starting to shade pink by the time we had it all squared away. Nevertheless, we were all able to make it to Fred's house before his parents woke up and got suspicious. The next few days were tense. I saw two sheriff's deputies parked in front of the store the following day and felt the bottom drop out of my stomach. We had come up with a cover story and rehearsed it multiple times in case we were questioned, and I expected cops to come knocking on my door any second, but they never did. I never even saw a report on the local news. In hindsight, D-Face probably knew it was us, but didn't want it to get out that he had used slave labor in his store. Heck, I bet the only reason he called the cops in the first place was so he could file a report and write it off on his taxes. In any case, we had hundreds, maybe even thousands of dollars worth of beer sitting in an old tool shed. And as young southern boys, it would be a bleeding sin to let it go to waste. We started celebrating, cautiously at first, but it didn't take long for word to get out that there were a couple of guys who could get their hands on beer, and by the end of the summer, we were hosting bonfires on the property that were absolutely packed with high school kids. We even had some offering to buy the beer from us, and by the beginning of September, we had made back any money that we lost out on thanks to DeFace's slavery shenanigans. These gatherings included a fair amount of chicks, and I think it's safe to say I lost my virginity thanks to the stolen beer in the shed. It was the best summer of my life. As for D-Face, I never saw or heard from him again. He sold the store a year later to a guy who seemed much nicer. I got another job working there the following summer for actual paychecks. The beer didn't even run out till the start of senior year. The last I saw of it was chugged by Fred at the end of a football game. So what do you guys think? Was it a jerk move? Now, I'm not one by any means to advocate for breaking and entering and theft, but in this instance, I think we let it slide. Besides, he said it was a long time ago. I think there's a statute of limitations on this type of thing, no? Either way, like he said, he wasn't left many other options. And while they had considered much worse options in terms of revenge, they chose the one that they felt was just. This guy just honestly ripped off a couple of kids, and that's a pretty jerk move. I feel a little bit of revenge is warranted. I guess this should just be a lesson to all small businesses. Don't rip off your employees, cause they will find a way to get back at you. And it seems like maybe this guy couldn't afford it since he had to sell the store a year later. Might have been for other reasons, but who knows? This guy could have ended up being put out of business by the same kids he tried to rip off. I feel like that's just karma, no? Horrible wife uses me for a meal ticket while she indulges in a very active social life, and I respond by giving her a legal pile driver. Well, this story starts out like many others. I, being in the US Army, become attracted to a woman whom I end up marrying. At first, she's all I could ever ask for in a woman. Sweet, caring, one hell of a cuddler. Doesn't really like video games like I do, but makes an effort to get into them so we can spend some time doing things together. We'll call her Witch, for reasons you'll soon know. I met Witch through one of the other soldiers I worked with, who we'll call Battle Buddy, since he was not at fault in this. It was in the middle of the week and I had just gotten a work order finished up and was taking a quick break for a drink of water. I heard Battle Buddy asking a few other soldiers if they were open for a date for this coming weekend. Now, I knew from a few other friends that Battle Buddy was straight, so I was curious as to why he was asking. Long story short, Battle Buddy had a female friend who was looking for a date for a movie that coming weekend. I offered to go with his friend. Big mistake. And she and I hit it off rather well and continued to see each other. Months pass and it hasn't been enough time for me to consider marriage yet, but she has some spontaneous ailments spring up out of nowhere. Seizures and they were legit. Since these only seemed to happen in her sleep and my command wouldn't let me stay off post with her without being married, light bulb. We got a courtroom wedding two weeks later. The added bonus, not only could I stay with her while she slept to be ready in case of another episode, but my TRICARE would fully cover her medical costs. I was happy, she was happy, I got to tell my command, now you can't stop me from staying with her, and we all lived happily ever after. Except we didn't. Things went well for a while, as I described at the beginning of the post, but after a bit, I started to notice things. Things like her needing to take her mother to the doctor's office quite frequently. Her mother was sickly, so I didn't think much of it at first. 
or needing to head to Walmart one town over because the one in our town didn't have what she needed in stock. Things like the car I bought and let her use seen parked in a lot next to several different trailer parks in a month. Well, as luck would have it, right as I started to get suspicious, I came down on orders to PCS to Korea. So, sidelining the investigation until I was able to continue, I packed, kissed my wife goodbye, and let the army send me where they wanted me. I spent a year in Korea, then came down on orders for Texas. I went there. It was there that I found out exactly what was going on, courtesy of her mom, brother, and her aunt and uncle. This woman, and I am not even kidding in the slightest, was sleeping with 60 different men, most of them soldiers. Her excuse to her family was, well, original poster's gay and doesn't want to come out, so he's pointing out the men I can sleep with since he knows that they're clean. So basically, this woman is using me as a paycheck and meal ticket and screwing everything with a pulse that happens to be male. The icing on the cake is that two weeks after I get the good news, she calls me and confesses to cheating on me. Once. The only reason she confessed? She was pregnant. There was no way I could be the father given that I was in a different state at the time. And the father was African American. I'm very much not African American, having been called neon white on more than one occasion due to my Irish ancestry. So there was no possible way this child would look like me at all. So my wife felt the need to break the news to me before she had the baby because she could no longer hide it. Well, things happened. I went back home without her knowing and removed my belongings from the house I bought to keep her from selling them once she realized what I was about to do and started divorce proceedings. This is revenge number one. I saw her boyfriend, not the baby's father, new guy entirely, driving my car. So I enlisted the help of her aunt and uncle to get my car back. They pulled up behind him in a parking lot, got out and talked to him normally, at which time I walked up from the other side of the parking lot. Her uncle asked to see the keys and upon receiving them, began taking the car key off the ring and waved me forward. I walked up, took the car key from him, looked at the guy and said, Hi, my name's Original Poster and this is my car. I'm taking it now. I waved him over to the sidewalk, removed everything from the car that didn't have my name on it, left the items with him, got in my car and drove off. I found out later that day that he had packed everything and left her. Apparently, he had been living in my house, eating my food, sleeping in my bed and wearing my clothes. Plus, she had been using the money I sent her every month to pay for his court costs and child support costs. Well, months went by, our court date came up, and my lawyer recommended that I file for sole use of the vehicle and the property, since it was obvious that she had committed adultery and didn't have a leg to stand on. We go to court, she counterfiles for the exact same, and since she refused to release the results of the paternity test, I get stonewalled. The exact words used by the judge were, I'm sorry, but without proof of paternity of the child, I cannot in good conscience approve either of these motions. So we set a new date for a private hearing with the judge and we wait. Nearly three months go by and the court date was finally near. I walked into the courthouse, met up with my lawyer, who had a demonic glint in his eye at the time and I was about to find out why, went into the courtroom and waited. 20 minutes later, she walked in, shot me a dirty look, which I did my best to ignore, and sat down. The judge came in five minutes later. The court was called to order, and the divorce trial commenced. Here, I found out just what had given my lawyer the little twinkle in his eye earlier on. He proceeded to ask the witch a series of questions, including, Is my client the father of your child? When was the child conceived? Where was my client during the time at which your child was conceived? Do you know who the father of your child is? Have you ever received child support from the father of your child? Basically, he questioned her into a legal corner in which she had to either answer truthfully or lie and suffer the legal ramifications of perjury in the face of easily provable evidence. She answered truthfully, lucky for her, and the court case continued. She presented her argument, littered with dirt she was trying to throw on me, insults to my person, questions about my sexual orientation, and claims that I was having a relationship with her 18-year-old cousin. I, falling back on my military training, simply sat up straight, folded my hands in front of me on the table, and stared at a spot on the wall slightly above the judge's left shoulder. I answered every question asked of me, offered no personal opinions, threw no dirt, and refused to sink to her level and question her sexuality. Subsequently, she had a more and more confused look on her face as I refrained from badmouthing her like she was doing me, and the divorce trial went by rather fast. 
At the conclusion of the trial, the judge looked over the paperwork submitted one last time, then looked to both of us. Are there any closing remarks or claims that need to be made? Which made one last parting swipe at me about currently living with her aunt and uncle. I had rented my own apartment months ago after finishing my military time and going back, and I merely shook my head and resumed staring at the wall. The judge looked over the papers one last time, set them down, and spoke the greatest words I have ever heard in my life. Well, looking over the evidence and testimonies presented, there really is only one decision I can come to. Mr. Original Poster, I'm approving your motions for exclusive use of the vehicle and property upon undeniable evidence of adultery. Mrs. Original Poster, the only one of your motions I am granting today is your request for a no-contact order, and that is more for Mr. Original Poster's benefit than your own. You seemed very combative and willing to cause him legal damage that he was not due, and your repeated attempts to overtalk me while I was reviewing the paperwork did not speak well of you. You no longer have a claim to either the property or the vehicle and will not contact Mr. Original Poster unless it is to have him clarify which items do not belong to you. Which had the audacity to work up a sniffle and ask the judge, but, but, but where do I go? What do I do for a place to live? The judge looked back at her and replied, well, Mrs. Original Poster, you have 30 days to figure that out after which you will not set foot on that property again, or else you will be held in contempt of court. Am I a jerk for being so satisfied with this conclusion? Wow, honestly, buddy, it just sounds like it's good that it's done and over with. That is a staggering number of men that she went through, given the course of, what, a year and a half that this story took place, give or take? And all of this while her husband is away and paying for all of her medical bills and everything else that she needs. There's a deeper problem going on with this woman, I think. Like, this is actually serial at this point. I don't know if it's an addiction or what, but she seems to clearly have an uncontrollable thing for soldiers. At least our original poster managed to get out with everything that was his and without any extra drama along the way. I have to say that overall, he handled it very well. A lot of the times when you're dealing with a person like this who's just so over the top and out there, you can't even relate to what they're saying or doing or even comprehend it. Just being the bigger person, sitting back, letting them tire themselves out and essentially work their own way into a corner is the best way to handle it. You can walk away afterwards knowing that you didn't sink to their level. And something like that really tends to help get closure and not leave things lingering in your mind for years and years. Guy at tech store thinks I know nothing about the computers I'm selling because I'm a woman. So I schooled him good. For reference, I'm a 5'2 stick insect of a girl who was 22 at the time and also six months pregnant. I was working in a tech store. We sold computers, laptops, phones, music devices, Bluetooth speakers, cables, and so on. We also did lessons, where people could sit with us for an hour and we would teach them how to use their devices. Generally, this was taken up by older people who weren't so technologyable. One day, there was no one in the store, so my coworkers decided to do a clear out of loads of junk in the back room. Since I was pregnant and there was going to be heavy lifting, they had me manning the floor. Since there was no one in, this basically meant I was just floating about daydreaming until a guy comes in. The uniform was black jeans and a bright blue t-shirt with the store logo on the front and back, and a white lanyard with the store name and then the worker's name on it. I was wearing this at the time. I go up to the guy and ask if he needs any help. He asks if there are any men available to help him. I tell him that whilst there are other staff in, they're currently busy in the back and not available to help with customers for some time. I asked him what he wanted help with. He said, Listen honey, you're in a delicate condition right now. I wouldn't want to stress your pretty head now, would I? Uh, WTF? I calmly told him that I would be perfectly fine dealing with his issue, but if he wanted to wait for another two hours, another member of staff may be available then. He smirks and then asks about one of the laptops on show. He tells me he wants a gaming computer. Not that you'd know anything about that, sweetheart. I then give my most jargon-filled speech about the laptop and point out that it's not at all suited to gaming, and that if he was set on a laptop, he would be best picking another model. I point out the one best suited to this, give a jargon speech about that one too, and then smile as sweetly as I can at him and ask if he's still following. He seems aghast and actually gasps at me. 
I was trying so hard not to laugh at him. He asks how I know all this stuff. I tell him I've been gaming since I was 6 years old, build computers for fun, and have PlayStation, Xbox, PC, and a laptop for gaming. I know my stuff. There's a reason I was hired here. He says nothing for a moment and then, but I thought girls in shops like this were just to make it look nice and because they have to or something. Um, no sir, I'm one of the most knowledgeable workers in the store aside from the manager. Then he just walks out, and when he gets to the door, I hand him a leaflet we have for the lessons. If you need anything else explained to you, I'd be happy to help you figure it out, sir. And off he went. I was so peeved that he actually had the gall to speak like that to anyone, let alone a very hormonal pregnant person. I just wanted to rip him to pieces. He genuinely seemed to think I was only hired because by the laws of discrimination, etc., they had to have at least one female member of staff and that I was therefore hired to attract male customers with my looks. I know sexism still exists, but I didn't expect to have it shoved in my face like that. I still can't believe that jerk. I myself worked in a tech store for a little while, and I can tell you that the female employees are absolutely treated like this. And on more than one occasion, I did get to witness a situation like this, and it is very satisfying to watch. It's ridiculous the presumptions that some people make that because of your gender that you don't have knowledge in a certain field. Believe it or not, people's interests can vary wildly, and that's not on you to decide what they should or shouldn't know. She clearly works in the store, so odds are she probably already knows more than you. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories, linked at the top of the description. And if you like Am I the Jerk, Give Am I the Genius a shot, linked in the description as well. Either way, thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.